I'm not an artist. Rather, I, I don't consider what I do as art. That might be a controversial take, but I'm going to talk about that and talk about how this philosophy has really guided my entire production music career. We're also going to look at a trap-infused 808 heavy plucky pizzicato dramedy cue on my week 43 vlog check-in. What is happening, everybody? This is Dave Croft. Welcome to my 52 Cues vlog check-in for week 43, where I am going through the entire year writing at least one cue a week, coming onto YouTube, talking about the cue itself, breaking it down, talking about my process, maybe going over things that are going on in the industry in my career or, or whatever. So that is what we are doing today. If this is your first time, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate your viewing. Just like I appreciate my Patreon patrons who support Keep This Channel Happening. If you want to know more about my Patreon, you can check out the information at the end of the video. If you want to skip over the vlog portion and get directly to the cue breakdown, I'm going to be looking at It's a Waiting Game today, and it's a 808 trap-infused dramedy cue with pizzicato strings and, uh, and stutter hats. You can check out the timestamp in the description below. So we're going to be talking today about um, one of the guiding principles that made production music really, really possible for me. And it's this concept that I am not an artist. I don't consider what I do necessarily as art. And, and I feel like this is a pretty controversial take, especially in the, um, in the music for media landscape. But, but hear me out, hear me out. Don't, don't, don't downvote me or hit the dislike or angry comments quite yet, but, but I, I really want you to hear me out. I, I consider production music, like they're kind of the graphic designers of media music, right? Film composers, they would be like the, the architects, you know, they, they, they're designing, they're designing buildings that are going to to dot the landscape. They're 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 changing the skyline of of New York or of a city. That's that's what that's what uh that's what film composers or game composers are doing. But for production music, we're not we're not really doing that. We're not looking to to change the game. We're not looking to to make bold artistic statements. We're we're if we're if we're in the architecture world, then then we're we're kind of setting out the the, the drywall for a, a new IHOP, right? We're, we're we're working out, you know, where are we gonna put the uh, the seating in in a doctor's office? We're we're graphic designers. We're designing business cards and signage, things that are super necessary and require an artistic skill. But is is a business card for Ashley Home Furniture? Is is that really art it's design but is it art i've gotten into lots of philosophical discussions with a friend of mine who is a musician but not a composer and he doesn't see this at all i've gotten into arguments on on facebook groups about what we're doing and how people really take offense to this idea that this isn't art to the point where they, they, they kind of called it prostituting yourself, which I, I think is between you and your muse or you and your, your conscience or, or whatever. I, I don't see it that way, but this guy really dug his heels in with that and kind of offensive, but you know, your take, your take is your take and that's your opinion. But I don't really consider what I'm doing as art. If this were in the food world, I would consider myself, you know, a, 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 a head chef at a four-star restaurant. That restaurant is is really popular, and the food is amazing. And as the chef, I work really hard to to make that food, that recipe. I use the best ingredients. I've studied. I have the best tools, the sharpest knives, and um, 
but at the end of the day, I'm probably going to make that $100 dish a hundred times in one day. And tomorrow, I'm going to wake up, going to put on my little chef's hat, and I'm going to go to my restaurant, and I'm going to make that same dish a hundred times. And when I get bored or when I get, when, when I feel like I'm, I'm in a cul-de-sac of creativity, then, then I might stretch my legs as a chef. I might, I might just throw some ingredients or just make something for myself. But at the end of the day, the food you make, while an expression of you, ultimately people have to buy it and they have to enjoy it. They have to tell their friends and they have to keep coming back and be willing to, to, to pay you know, hundred dollars for a bowl of pasta or something. But from my perspective, I'm making that bowl of pasta, that hundred dollar rigatoni or whatever. I'm making that all day, every day, as much as, as much as they'll eat, I'll keep making it. And this puts me not in the mindset of an artist, but as an artisan. And I know my students have heard this because I'm all about this mentality. I am an artisan of music. I'm not an artist. Now, personally, I don't have any desire to have my name up in lights. I mean, I think it would be cool to see a title card on on a film, Music by Dave Croft. But that's not like a deep desire. Even though my career or my passion in music was really jump started by film music, Back to the Future, Alan Silvestri, that score changed my life, quite literally changed the trajectory of what I wanted to do with my myself creatively. But I've never really had that desire to, to see my name in lights or on a title card. That's not been a motivating factor. If anything, a motivating factor for my career has been to be able to make a sustainable living making music. Make a living making music. Make money making music. And any way that I, that I could do that, whether it's you know, teaching lessons or, or uh, doing film scores or games, or the niche the little corner that I found is in production music. And I think it's one of the most sustainable careers as a, that a composer can take because, A, there's a lot of need for music. There's a lot of TV getting made, especially unscripted documentary reality, if you will, reality TV. There's a lot of this TV getting made and it all needs music and nearly all of it uses production music, which, which means that there's, a, there's a, quite a bit of competition, lots of people going to this, to this career as they learn more about it from you know, the internet, from forums, or from YouTube channels just like this. But one of my goals isn't to, to, to make art. When I sit down to compose music, I, I don't write like, I don't, well, I don't set out to write kind of what's coming out of my spirit or what's coming out of, out of my muse. I, I, I don't write music as an expression of me as an artist. I'm not looking to make a statement. When I write a cue, like we're going to look at today, it's a waiting game, fusing like hip hop and dramedy, orchestral sounds. Ultimately, I want it to be good. I want it to be catchy. I I want it to sound great. I'm using good sounds, but ultimately I I want to get it on TV. And I am happy. I'm happy for my music to be in the background underneath some, some scene on a show where I don't know, they're bickering or they can't figure out how to solve a puzzle or something, you know, or, or, or a bumbling, a bumbling dad or, or a kid kind of fumbling their way through problem solving. That's, that's what I want my music to do. It's, it's the furniture of the scene. It's not the, the main attraction. And that, that, is, that is what an artisan does, in my opinion. An artisan makes, makes or crafts works to a very high skill, very high quality, but at the end of the day, the consumer judges its value. 
the consumer in this case being a music supervisor or an editor choosing from a playlist or whatever. But at the end of the day, there is value being assigned to this commodity, to this widget that I'm making in my studio and putting it out there. And I want someone to buy it. Right? If I was a, a baker, I would be baking cookies and going to a farmer's market and I would roll out my cart and I would put my cookies out there and I would sit there waiting for people to walk by and buy my cookies. And if the macadamia nuts are selling, but the walnut ones aren't, I'm not going to keep making walnut ones because nobody's buying them. But if the macadamia nut cookies keep selling out, I'm going to make as many as I can. Again, high quality good ingredients, perfect, not perfect, good tools that I am constantly learning to use better. See last week's video, that's a new tool to me that I'm trying to incorporate to better my cues. But it's the mentality behind it. And here's why this was so important for me. When I first started composing, I felt I felt like the act of composing had to be this effort, almost like this birthing process, like it had to, it had to really kind of come from deep within. And everything that I wrote had to A, be the most original thing on the planet, and B, it had to be some expression of me as an artist. And that felt really heavy. That felt super heavy. And I, I, I felt the weight of that every time I sat down to write, which meant that often, especially early, the pieces that I was writing, the cues, tracks, I didn't even know to call them cues back then, the music that I was writing didn't live up to that because I had held the, the standard was Alan Silvestri, Danny Elfman, Thomas Newman, John Flippin' Williams. I'm talking about a high bar, and I wasn't hitting that. And so I would come away from the composition compositional process kind of defeated every single time. And it just felt heavy, which led to resistance and not wanting to do it. And I think that's why my career took a giant detour into percussion and into drums and being a drum instructor and, and gigging and all of that. I, I feel like that's that's what kind of shifted me off of what deep down I, I knew I wanted to be, which was a composer. But when I shifted my thinking, when I realized that the music I was writing needed to serve not myself and not even a specific listener, the music needed to serve a scene, it needed to serve a purpose. When I approached it from the artisan mentality of I'm making a widget. I might be making a hundred of these. Each one's going to be good and different and tasty. And and I'm not I'm not cutting corners. I'm not just you know cookie cutter. Literally, I'm not I'm not like just cookie cutter producing these things. But when I realize that the the music is serving underneath a gum commercial, or, or it's it's the business card aspect. When I approached it from the artisan mentality, what I noticed was an enormous weight getting lifted. The weight of originality, the weight of art. And that was really changing for me. That was life-changing, career-changing. Because if you set out to write hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cues, but each one of those cues has the weight of being art, that to me feels completely insurmountable. Like, no, that's I, I couldn't do it. Could you imagine if you know Michelangelo was setting out to 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 make a bunch of statues and okay, I need to make a thousand of these statues. But each one has to has to be like the statue of David. Or each painting has to be the Sistine Chapel. Make a thousand of those? No. So approaching the production music process as an artisan lifted the weight, the expectation that I think I just put on myself 
of what these cues had to be. And it started with understanding the purpose they're serving. Again, please hear me. I'm not saying that production music is cheaper. I'm not saying that I'm looking to cut corners. You know, I'm not saying I'm, 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 I'm not trying to sound like a hack, but it's all about the philosophical mindset behind it. Now, there are times when I feel like that has boxed me in. I feel like I either get creatively bored or I'm just, I need to stretch my creative legs a little bit and just write for myself. And that's, and, and I do, I don't do it often, but I felt that. I felt it somewhat recently as, as I'm coming, you know, to the end of the year, the end of these, these 52 cues, we're on week uh, 43 now, and I'm wrapping up a contract, wrapping up 12 dramedy cues, and this is one of them. And it just, I'm feeling a little bit wrung out. And so I've reached out to some, uh, some game developer friends of mine and saying, hey, do you, do you need music? Because in the film music world, the game music world, then that, that's where you can stretch your legs a little bit. You can. Film music needs to be elevated beyond the graphic design of music. It should be. I consider film music art, even though they serve very similar purposes. But production music, library music, dare I say stock music, is that art? Controversial take, but I say no. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'd love to hear your comments. Please keep it respectful. And guy from the Facebook group who just uh, just unloaded on me, uh, you don't have to comment. Although I'll, I'll, I'll engage you, that's fine. But uh, I'd love to know your thoughts. What do you think? Have have you, if if you're a production music composer and you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tracks out there, I'd love to hear your concept, your your compositional philosophy behind behind your output. Because this is what I found has been one of the keys to sustainability in a career in production music, which requires a great deal of output. Hundreds of cues. My goal is a thousand cues, and I'm about halfway there. But my goal is to have hundreds of cues across hundreds of libraries, getting hundreds of placements, each, you know, $80 here, $200 there, creating a snowball of income that creates a sustainable career in music but I'd love to know your thoughts. Let me know in the comments below. So with that, let's check out my cue from week 43. This is called It's a Waiting Game, and it is a dramedy cue with plucky pizzicato strings, which how can you dramedy without plucky pizzicato strings, as well as a trap influenced hip hop elements. So we're going to check that out and we'll talk about it on the other side.
was It's a Waiting Game, a hip-hop-infused dramedy cue. And uh, it starts with, uh, with pizzicato strings. I mean, yes, it's a trope. Yes, it's a cliche. But, <laughs> again, you're going to the restaurant. You show up at McDonald's and you order chicken nuggets. Then you better make with the chicken nuggets. And uh, <laughs> I'd all say that to diminish what I'm doing here, diminish any production music composers. But just... It's it's okay. It's okay to use pizzicato strings in a dramedy cue. It's what editors expect. It's what music supervisors expect. It's what it's what the audience expects. And so, I, I don't know. I, I don't think I don't think this is the 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 place to try to subvert expectations within reason. Hot take. Again, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. But I'm using Symphobia. Uh, my, uh, yeah, if you've been watching this channel for more than a day and you've heard me prattle on about Symphobia, absolutely love it. Using the close mics there. But to give it a little bit more density, I am layering this with the Vienna Symphonic. Just to create. I don't know, just just change it up a little bit. It doesn't sound quite off, you know, off the shelf, uh, off the rack rather. But um, yeah, just to give it a little bit of density. And you'll notice that these articulations are a little bit different. And this is because uh, Symphobia, or not Symphobia, Vienna, Vienna, like really responds, their pizzicatos respond to length. So if I play it really short, it's really short. If I, if I hold, then it's really long. And so this just makes sure that all the notes are connected and it doesn't sound too choppy. Now I have top and bottom, high strings and low strings. I separate these out like this for stemming purposes. So I know that when I need a bass only stem, then it's all right there. And the low strings are, are it's kind of a call and response kind of thing. You know, re really helping the end, or at this point, the midpoint of the phrase. But then I bring in my first hip hop element here, which are my 808s that I have used. I'm using Alchemy. These are one shots that I've loaded into Alchemy. And I like them because there are four oscillators here, or four components. All right, so there's that one. There's this one. And then I have this guy. I can layer them together if I wanted, but um, truth be told, kind of moving forward, I probably would have loaded this into Serato Sample, mainly because with, with Serato Sample, I have the option of actually stretching the sound or syncing the sound. So if I have a one shot that is, that is one second long, especially with 808, sometimes they can be two, three seconds long with big, long release tails. And if I were playing that on C, that's, you know, let's say it's two seconds long when I when I play a C. If I play an octave above it, then that gets compressed. It gets shortened in order to achieve a note that sounds uh, an octave higher than it literally plays the, the sound file twice as fast. Likewise, going down, it will play the, the sample twice as slow, which yields a sound an octave below the note you're playing, which is great. Except that by, by make, making it twice as fast, you're shortening it. So a two second sample becomes a one second sample. And the opposite way, a two second sample becomes a four second sample. And that can yield sometimes unpredictable results. And so with Serato Sample, I can actually sync one shots so that if I play an octave above it, it will pitch it an octave higher, but keep it being two seconds long. Likewise, it will pitch it an octave lower, but keep it two seconds, which when stretched to the extreme can can yield some some pretty weird artifacts, you know, and some some just some digital noise that can not that can be less than desirable. But I do like the idea of of incorporating Serato sample for one shots because of that flexibility. So I really, really dig that. So uh, and with that, I've loaded in a hi-hat as a one-shot. So this is a one-shot hi-hat taken from Splice. Love me some Splice that I've loaded in. And you'll notice the chops. I have my, my middle note here, but 
I have a note which is a half step above it. So when I'm programming, it's a half step above it, but it's key shifted three semitones and the note below it is five semitones below. So we have three semitones above, three uh, five semitones below. And this is one of the, one of the aspects of, of trap is the stutters not being the same sound, but moving around pitch wise. Right. The only thing I wish Serato Sample did, and any of you Serato Sample users out there, if it can do this, let me know. But I was hoping that I could pan each one of these because I know I can adjust the level, filter the attack, release, key shift, time stretch of each individual chop, or in this instance, the sample placed around the key, the, the, the keyboard. But I didn't see a way to pan it. And that's what I'd really like because I'd like for let's say the note above the, the the three half steps above i'd love to push that a little bit to the right the one below have it pushed a little bit to the left so it kind of the stutter not only moves in pitch but kind of moves around the stereo image as well i was, I was kind of hoping for that but I, I couldn't find a way to do that and then i do have some some hi-hat chops again serato sample it's my uh, love language right now and uh it's pretty interesting Right. And so it's kind of like almost a reverse kind of kind of vibe to it. But I didn't use it nearly that aggressively. Uh, they have some some really strange. some Yeah, just rhythmically, it's kind of weird. So I'm using just a handful of notes bouncing around. And I in order to create that stereo panning, the stereo image effect, then I've thrown on a tremolo with with a, a light um, bar long movement or bar long panning. So it's kind of bouncing back and forth across the stereo field. And this is something I do when I layer in hi-hats and hip hop, I'll have one kind of right down the middle and then I'll put one more onto the sides. That way they, they fit, they fit together. Then I bring in some, some claps and some snares. These are alchemy instruments that moving forward, I probably will start loading these types of things into Serato sample. I just, like I said, I wasn't hip to it. <laughs> but uh, here I have some claps that I have layered together. And it's just like the 808s, different one shots that I can uh, actually bring in to alchemy and just an easy way to MIDI, to MIDI control these instead of laying in, laying in waves. Because once you start laying in waves and need to adjust the tempos and you get into flex time and all of that. Then the next phrase, bring in a shaker, was just a standard egg that I have panned left and right. Nothing at all fancy to that. A little bit of compression, some reverb. Added some octave, uh, not some octave layers, but uh, an octave below here just to make it denser. And then the, the last four bars added a harmony note above it. As we get into my breakdown. All right. So before I talk about that, there are a couple of little edit points. This is something that I do. I'll add a little, little vacuum. I call them vacuum moments where it just kind of the energy all kind of swoops up and then drops. I do this all the time. I do it there and I do it once more here. Just again, create little edit points. And I think that really helps out. So then I, I, I go in to my breakdown. Interesting note about this guitar. My first instinct was to bring in my guitar. I have guitars hanging you know, like in the shot. And so I plugged it in and it just wasn't, maybe I'm using the wrong guitar but it, I just wasn't feeling it. It wasn't, it was kind of pitchy and out of tune and I was getting quickly frustrated, did not like it because I couldn't, couldn't see a way to the sound that I, that I wanted, not without a lot of, a lot of time. So what this is, is not my recorded guitar. Instead, it is session guitarist from Native Instruments that I loaded in a, I've already removed it, but I loaded in one of their, their presets. Let's see, I was using the deluxe sunburst. 
So I loaded in one of the presets, and I think it was, let's see if I can remember, is it AirPlay? Anyway, I, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna spend time, but it was one of these sounds. It wasn't quite right. And so I rendered it to audio and then moved all the, 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 the waves around, chopped it all up, and then created my own guitar loop, essentially. And maybe, you know, I mentioned, maybe I was using the wrong guitar. I was using my Strat for this, and I think the Sunburst is a Les Paul, and maybe I should should have been using like a, a double coil Les Paul. Uh, not that I have one, but I have, you know, a knockoff, my I Ibanez knockoff. So things strip out just with just the low end, added some fifths, layer in the claps halfway through, a little reverse vacuum moment right here. And then bring in the main melody again, but this time I, it's, it's twice as long uh, in music theory, compositional terms, this will be called an augmentation. But quite simply, all I did was I, I took the, the motif and I MIDI stretched it, made it twice as long, turning half note melody moments into whole note melody moments. And by the way, in Logic, you do that by holding down Option and then dragging it. And that's, that's quite literally all I did there. And then I wanted to create the illusion of a fermata. One, two, three, four, five, one. So instead of like going in and automating my tempo or doing any any kind of uh, metric gymnastics like that, all I did was I added a five, four bar and I put the stop on the and of four. One and two and three and four and. And one of the things I often do when I need to really accentuate a syncopation, especially in a moment like this, I will do a reverse crash or some sort of sweep, some reverse energy into the syncopated note, and it makes it feel a little bit more solid, like it feels like you're in, you're in firm footing. And this is a clear edit point for an editor. And that's that was the driving motivation. Again, that's the artisan mentality. That is the craft of it. There, there, this wasn't an artistic statement. This was the artist or the, uh, the editor wants a side of ranch dressing with their French fries. Who am I to question them? They need an edit point. So I'm going to, I'm going to give them an edit point. Try to do it as artistically as possible, but this wasn't, this wasn't motivated by, by an artistic mindset. And again, if you skipped ahead and you're wondering why I'm talking about French fries and ranch dressing, I talked about being a chef. All right. So we kind of have a little break, a little breakdown kind of as we reintroduce the hook and then, and then everything comes back in nice and strong as we finish up building, building, building into the button and that is it's a waiting game that is it's a waiting game i hope you enjoyed checking that out and uh, i really enjoyed writing it uh, if you enjoyed this and if you want to see how a cue like this is getting made this is a cue that i wrote during my most recent music production live stream which is a benefit to my patreon patrons and so i want to thank my patreon patrons if you're interested in seeing these kind of live streams or just supporting the channel to be a patron it's just one dollar a month and uh, i would be most appreciative of that you don't have to at all uh, if you just want to enjoy the channel and receive, this is not a transactional thing. The people that, that uh, support the channel, they support the channel, I like to believe, because they get a lot out of what I'm doing here and, um, and they want to help support the community. So uh, that is going to do it for me for this week. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope it was helpful. I hope you had a great week 43. Again, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Are you an artisan? And uh, hear your thoughts in the comments below. I do check all of those out and I look forward to hearing from you. But that's going to do it for me. I hope you have a stellar week 44. Until next time, peace.